to do something I haven't done before, but which I think is a really good um, exercise. And that is that I'm actually going to create one of my little slides right here for you. And I'm going to call it the Access Waterfall for Technology. Who gets technology first? And the answer to that is the military gets it first. They get it first because the global network, in fact, I'll say the military via espionage, the, the global network is literally spying on innovators around the globe, seeing what they're doing, what they're going to be doing, working out then prior, or prioritizing uh, what technologies they want to get their hands on first and or developing their own. Because I should mention that obviously the military has its own R&D programs as well, but it is strong, it has a very strong interest in um simply stealing the secrets of other nations or other co foreign corporations, et cetera, et cetera. So the military has access to technology long before we do. And after the military is what I call the military industrial complex. So this is where the contractors, et cetera, um, are also given uh, access to cutting edge technology that is not yet available in the commercial space. So I'll just give a couple of quick examples there in terms of the military having primary access. In one of the NSA documents, it talks about, it's talking about 1990, and it's talking about how um, the global network as it existed in 1990, uh, already operated and had access to a multinational multimedia portal. So they were sharing videos and picture files between themselves in 1990. Now, in 1990, we were using monochrome screens, and we are lucky if we could use a news group. We didn't have email, and these guys were sharing, like, video files and photos with each other the way that we were in what, like 99, 2000, 2001? And this is what I mean about we're a decade behind them. And just in terms of the military industrial complex getting access to technology before any of us do, um, there are some fantastic WikiLeaks files about that. So um, in WikiLeaks hacking team files. So this is an Italian... Uh, corporation, private hacking corporate, mercenary hacking corporation called the Hacking Team. In their emails, which were leaked to WikiLeaks, they had um, marketing materials from uh, defense industry weapons manufacturers. And in those emails, they were being offered access to hardware and technology, which was only available to the military industrial complex, which was not in the commercial sphere, which you and I could never go and access or buy, but the access to it was being extended to um, corporations and companies like Hacking Team, who are like sat satellite companies or satellite service providers for the military industrial complex. So that's yet an another example of what I would call tier two. So tier one is like the military is the top of the food chain. The military is the control. This planet and all of our countries, not our governments are in control, it's the military are in control. They are tier one for access to technology. Tier two is this military industrial complex. Okay, so then tier three. I would consider tier three would be the uh, global, the commercial market for the global elite, right? So this is the people who can, oh, because that's a, just one other thing about that hacking team, the Italian crowd that I was talking to you about. A second ago, they um, that mailing list, the just to just to receive 
the emails, the marketing emails from the defence contractors uh, cost 8,000 euros. Like you had to subscribe, you had to have a membership and pay 8,000 euros just to even access these lists of um, of technology hardware that were available for sale from the weapons manufacturers. So that gives you some idea. Again, it's about creating that barrier, right? Like a normal person cannot afford to pay 8,000 euros to receive some marketing emails from a defense contractor. But a corporation, a company um, in the military, as a part of the military industrial complex, pff, what do they care about 8,000 euros? 8,000 euros to them is like $8 to us. So they use money to create a barrier and to restrict that access, access to information about what even is available. And it takes you and I reading something like WikiLeaks years and years after the fact to even begin to get an understanding about what these guys have access to and what is out there in this world. So the next tear down from the military industrial complex would be, I will put the global elite. And by this, I mean people with money. And I'm sure like you would have seen it because they like to show their stuff off on like, you know, whatever lifestyles of the rich and famous and the many MTV offshoots in more recent years. Um, you will see in the mega mansions, they have technology in their homes, which is beyond the wildest dreams of any consumer. And the reason, once again, that they have that is because they have money. And so those who have been, uh, whose activities have been blessed by the systems of control that run our society have been fiscally rewarded. And not only um, does that mean they have a lot of money, but it means they have access to technologies which you and I simply cannot afford. So yet again, money is being used as a barrier, an entry barrier to access to technology and to innovation. So after these guys, then we have the US commercial market. So this is like, you know, somewhere down the track, however many years. You think about like 1990, this is a multimedia portal, right? So maybe 92, these guys are getting access to it. So maybe 95, these guys are starting to get access to it. So now it's 1999 and they're, they're ready to roll it out to the American public. And generally speaking, the American public are the first ones to get access to um, the first regular citizens of the world to get access to technology. So I'll put here US commercial market. And then after the US commercial market, this is where access to technology becomes a uh, I'd say almost a bludgeoning tool that is used um, for other countries that have um, relationships with the US for whatever, to whatever extent. So I would put here US MIC favoured uh, partner countries. So this is where you see the rest of the five eyes is getting, I mean, I can tell you coming from New Zealand. I can absolutely tell you coming from New Zealand. New Zealand, think about it, is one of the four most favoured countries in theory of the United States around the world. You know, the, the English-speaking countries are this tight-knit group, tight-knit group, tight-knit group that stick together. Um, and New Zealand was always behind the US on technology, always. We always had to see and hear about things before they ever made it to us. So New Zealand would still be somewhere close to the top of that list. But now think about somewhere like, and I'm just pulling like a country name out of a hat, Ghana. Like where is Ghana on the, where are the citizens of Ghana on the access to technology waterfall? They are like way the hell down the bottom. And then now think about somewhere like Russia or somewhere like Iran. Where are they on the access to technology waterfall? Not only are they massive targets for R&D, espionage, um, for anything they do manage to develop themselves out of their own universities or their own science um, and research, research spaces, but they are also the last to be granted any type of access to 
um, innovation from the global network. So then we would have at the bottom here, the very, 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 very tail end of the waterfall is the US MIC least favored non-partner countries. I'll just make this full screen so hopefully you can all see it. So there you go. For any of you who were wondering whether I actually make these screens myself, whether I make these slides myself, yes, all of this is my own research, is my own um, deductions, and it's based on years of research. And if you go back through my body of work and my body of articles, you will discover that every little piece of information I give you here is from research that I did at any given time and wrote about in my long form articles. So I'm just going to save that. And that is an excellent screen, I think, in my opinion, to show the, the way that access to technology is staggered in favor of the global network of intelligence agencies and the military and the warmongers and the war wages of this world and how us little regular people down here are the absolute last to enjoy the fruits of any technological innovation. We've also seen from studying the NSA documents that there is a humongous obsession inside the NSA with uh, what they call budget day. And this is where once a year they prepare their budgets for congressional over, uh, approval. And there are multiple documents uh, in the NSA Snowden files where the NSA is warning its personnel do not submit anything which may in any way justify um, restriction of our funding. Um, and they also tell their personnel that if they run their documents past a certain budgeting office, that they will be sure to reword their requests and applications in a way which is uh, most likely to maximise the funding that they can get from Congress for their activities. So receiving the maximum amount of money possible is absolutely and definitely uh, one of their strategic objectives. They are obsessed with stopping Congress getting information about their activities, but yet maximizing the amount of money that they can get Congress to approve for their activities and they have no qualms about bending the truth in order to be able to justify that. world we operate under this fallacy this complete fallacy of a meritocracy we're told like anybody can become a millionaire if you have a great idea and you work really really hard and you have good people around you you can be the next bill gates i'm telling you for a fact that's bullshit and kim.com is a classic example of that 
Kim.com had great ideas and great people and built amazing products that everybody liked and hundreds of millions of people were using and was consuming 4% of global internet traffic. And what happened to Kim.com? Ah, oh, hello. His house was raided by 100 armed police with helicopters and attack dogs. And he's now been through seven years of litigation and they're attempting to extradite him. Where, where are they attempting to extradite him to? They're attempting to extradite him to the Eastern District Court of Virginia, which is the same court that prosecuted John Kiriakou that is trying to extradite and prosecute Julian Assange and that wants to prosecute Edward Snowden. So why is he being um, prosecuted in the Eastern District Court of Virginia? Apparently for copyright infringement. Copyright infringement is a civil offence and not a criminal offence. And yet his home is raided. All of his personal belongings are seized. His business is forcibly shut down. The FBI seized his domains and his websites. All of his customer data was erased from the face of this earth. And he has been relentlessly persecuted and smeared in the media. Why? Because the meritocracy does not exist. Because Kim.com was supporting WikiLeaks, Kim.com took a stand against the intelligence agencies and would not capitulate and allow his business to be run by them. And as a result, he became a target of them. And this is what happens at all levels of technological development. If your project shows any promise or, or any significance, you will either be bought out or you will be destroyed. Likewise, they like these monopolies to exist in the hardware and software space, just like they want to create monopolies and maintain monopolies in the telco and ISP space. So we have how many cell phones in this world? We have hundreds of millions, if not by now, probably a billion cell phones in this world. And how many operating systems are they running? I mean, we have nearly the entire planet is on two operating systems, two mobile operating systems. Why do you think that is? How can it be that on a planet the size of ours and with as many software developers as we have, that there's only two major, really two major um, operating systems for mobile communications? And it comes back to that same principle. The intelligence agencies are actively restricting innovation in the technology space and particularly in mobile, anything related to internet. They want to control who is supplying hardware and software services to the consumer markets. And it's easier for them to control if there are a very small number of corporations that are dominating those markets. And so it's in their best interest to prevent people from being able to develop alternatives to that. So in innovation, we, d we all know, you know, the CIA has NQTEL, they, um, they use money. It's another form of coercion. They will identify projects, development projects, which are of strategic importance to them, and they will fund them. And in funding them, they're then able to control the direction of that project. They're able to control who is or isn't involved in the advancement of that project. They're able to control the corporate relationships of the, that project. Um, they are able to also, the other side of the coin, if you don't take their money and you don't work with them, they're actually able to effectively destroy uh, any startup that gets in their way. Donate and support the campaign. 
if you can't donate, which many people can't in the current economic climate, please just promote the website, promote the donation link, promote the streams, and let people know that this exists, that this movement exists. Let them know why it's important and ask them to back this campaign. Because if we can get some successful suits going against these guys, we can really make them think twice and have some serious impact, maybe even set some really important legal precedents uh, to fight back against these networks of agents who have been destabilizing our civil society across the Western world. But I mean, with 100 partner agencies across most of the world, they have the capacity to commit these crimes against citizens, against um, around most of this planet. And as I've said in previous videos, that's not okay with me. And that's why I've dedicated my life to fighting back against them, because I feel it, it, that we have to do it. We have to do it. We can't just get to the point where this total global surveillance state that we live in is able to actively destroy anybody who challenges it. We must stand up against it and we must do it together. We are strong together. With hundreds of us and thousands of us working together, we are much stronger. Hi everybody and welcome to my channel. My name is Susie Dawson. I'm an activist, a journalist and the current president of the Internet Party of New Zealand. Thank you so much for being here tonight. This is episode four of Opening the Five Eyes, Exposing the Spies, which is a live campaign fundraising event for the Hash One versus Five Eye campaign. That campaign is the result of many years of me attempting to try to gain visibility and spread the word about abuses by intelligence agencies against activists, journalists and regular citizens around the world. And in this campaign, I now am trying to raise funds for my newly acquired awesome human rights legal team to sue the intelligence agencies who persecuted me for my activism and for my journalism and to try and bring a halt to the illegal activities that they have been engaged in. You can find, hello to everybody, I can see you in chat saying hi to me. Um, you can find out more information about this campaign at number one, letters VS, number five, letter I, one versus five I dot com. I would really, really appreciate people either donating to the campaign to fund my quest for justice or to sharing the donate link to as many people as you can. That link is one versus five I dot com slash donate. Okie dokie. Um, last week I put together a little Twitter poll asking you what content you wanted me to cover. And you said you wanted to talk about the ways that the intelligence agencies subvert all the different sectors of society. So that's the program that we did last Sunday night. The second favourite option was understanding World War Three. And so that is what we're going to look into tonight. First, I just want to have a little chat with you guys about what has been going on with me. If you saw my Twitter uh, timeline tonight, you would have seen that I nearly didn't do this stream tonight. In fact, for most of today, I was thinking to myself, I can't stream tonight. I can't stand the idea of being on camera and doing this. It wasn't because I was worried about the content or the campaign. Um, I am really blessed and grateful that I even have the opportunity to run this campaign and to have a chance at obtaining some kind of justice. 
but I was overwhelmed for a lot of personal reasons, some of which I've decided that I'm going to share with you tonight. So for there's been a lot going on for me. So this week, um, Nikki Hager, who is a very famous New Zealand investigative journalist who has written some seminal books about the intelligence agencies and who has himself been targeted by the, the same intelligence agencies who have targeted me, um, managed to get into the media this week um, official findings that the New Zealand spy agencies had spied on him. Uh, every time there is a major development in my home country that relates to uh, this, this type of targeting against people, for reasons that I don't understand entirely, I don't actually feel triumphant about it. I feel really upset about it and I get really angry and I get quite miserable actually, as you can now see as I'm practically crying on stream. I get really upset and miserable because it brings back everything that I have been through and that my children and that my family have been through. People are complaining that um, we've been cut off. <laughs> Can you please confirm for me? Oh, you say it's back now. Okay, I'll just try and repeat what I was saying. I was just saying that there were some big developments in New Zealand this week regarding revelations of um, illegal spying by the agencies on a major New Zealand journalist, Nikki Hager. Nikki's a really good guy. I actually know his sister pretty well. Um, his work is extremely important. Um, but instead of being triumphant or feeling victorious or uh, vindicated by these revelations, I actually just got really upset by them um, for several reasons. Firstly, because it brings back every single thing that I've gone through and also the impacts on the people around me and my kids and my family. Um, but also because I feel a really deep sense of injustice um, particularly because of the way that the media treated me in New Zealand um, and because of um, there's just a lot of unresolved stuff and particularly particularly actually in relation to Nikki. I have no ill feeling for Nikki. To, to the contrary, I feel great admiration for him and I'm very happy that he's able to achieve redress and he's able to get really high level support and that um, people understand the dangers that he faced and the things that he goes through. Um, but one of the big criticisms of me that I've had, particularly from media, um, about my situation in my case is they compare me to Nikki. They say, oh, well, Nikki is targeted and he doesn't have, he didn't have to leave New Zealand or, you know, how come Nikki is able to be in New Zealand and you've had to leave New Zealand? And on one hand, it's quite a, a um, compliment to me that I would even be <laughs> considered in the same light as Nikki Hager. But on the other hand, our situations are completely fundamentally different. And this is something that people who judge my decision to leave New Zealand seem to fail completely to understand. When Nikki was being targeted by the intelligence agencies, he had a 30 year long track record of internationally awarded journalism. Every single person in the country of New Zealand knows him and who he is and what he does and the risks that he faces. He has a ginormous international support network at the highest levels of journalism and of politics. When I was targeted in New Zealand, I had none of that. I was not an established journalist. I did not have major political support. I did not have an international network of people willing to advocate for me. 
there was no public understanding of who I was or what my work was or why I would be targeted, none whatsoever, because I had actually operated in my activism. I stayed anonymous. I stayed off camera and I did everything behind the scenes. So there, I had no public support whatsoever. I had no media support whatsoever. My situation couldn't have been any more dramatically different than Nikki Hager's situation, and yet I'm constantly judged in the same light or the same league as Nikki Hager, which is really unfair. When I was targeted in New Zealand, I was a single mother a single mother with two kids living in the suburbs. I had nobody willing to stand up or protect for me or to advocate for me or to protect me. I had only my fellow media team members who were also being targeted and who had no resources and no ability to protect me. The police openly told me to my face that I would continue to be targeted and that uh, so the, their exact words were, so long as you're an activist, this will keep happening to you. So I couldn't do anything about it whatsoever. It was I was like a sitting duck and nobody, nobody would protect me. Not politicians, not media, not the police, no state agencies. I had no ability to maintain safety for myself or for my children. So every time that another big revelation comes out in New Zealand that does vindicate me, such as the State Services Commission report that came out in 2018, and it confirmed that the exact same companies which I had been saying were doing this since I'd been saying since 2012, six years before it was confirmed, I'd been saying exactly who's doing it, what they're doing, who they're doing it to. When that report came out, I should have been happy. I should have been like, thank God. Now everybody knows that what I was saying was true. I wasn't some crazy crackpot making this shit up. I was telling the truth all along. But to be honest, I didn't really feel vindicated. I felt miserable. I felt upset and miserable. And I put a public statement out actually on that day that the report was released and you can tell how angry I am when you read that statement. I was just so angry at what I perceived was the total abandonment of me by anybody who could have actually helped me when I was in New Zealand. So leaving New Zealand for me was, it was like stay and die quietly or leave and have a chance at continuing my work and telling people what was going on. And so that's the option I chose. So it hurts, quite frankly. It hurts to be judged against people who have completely different situations and scenarios to me um, and to have my decisions, which I felt like I had no other decision I possibly could make at the time, to have those decisions judged against the actions of people who have the types of visibility and protection um, and resources and support that I never, ever, ever had when I was in New Zealand. So that's the first thing that's bugging me. But then the second thing that's really um, hurting me too is every single day that I'm in exile, I see firsthand the impacts of that exile upon my kids um, and my family, but primarily my kids. And I've chosen tonight to actually start to talk about this. And for me, it's a humongous risk for me to talk about the things that upset me and the things that I'm going through is an absolutely humongous risk. It's a risk for multiple reasons. First of all, because I inevitably am blamed for what's been done to me, despite the fact that I'm not the person who did it. And it's a risk because the people who continue to persecute me use anything that I say or anything that I disclose uh, to continue to persecute me and continue to hurt me. And for me, it's always been a really double-edged sword as to whether or not I, I talk about my kids. And so generally, other than saying that I have children, I've said basically nothing about them. 
but the impacts on my parenting of the children when I was in New Zealand being targeting, being targeted were absolutely devastating. And the impacts on my ability to parent in exile are similarly devastating. The invasion of privacy is next level. I remember in New Zealand knowing, knowing that every word I said in my home was being recorded and my daughter asking me about to tell her about the birds and the bees and me having to sit there and try and explain to my child the facts of life and particularly the facts of being a girl and becoming a woman, knowing that every word I said was being scrutinized by security agencies that had it in for me and were trying to destroy me. It, I feel like they robbed me and my children of some of the most precious moments and precious years of our life and things that normal parents can just take for granted, I could never take for granted. And I had to constantly make decisions relating to my children. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't know how upsetting this would be to talk about. I had to constantly make decisions relating to my children in the realistic and practical context of us being targeted by the state. For example, I lived in constant fear. One of the things my daughter complained about to me is she always says, mum, you're, um, you're hypervigilant. Um, and she's talking about, not about hypervigilant, about being targeted, but hypervigilant in terms of, I would live in fear that my kids would um, be jumping off the trampoline or whatever, would hurt themselves and would end up having to go to hospital for whatever reason, and that it would be used as a pretext to take my children away from me to punish me for my activism and journalism. Because there are countless other cases where this has been done to activists and journalists who are single parents, where they come at you through your kids, that's what it comes down to. They come at you through your children. They have no qualms about doing that. So my kids couldn't just play like normal kids. Like when I was a kid growing up, I broke my wrist, I broke my arm, I broke my leg. It didn't matter. My parents went and took me to the hospital, get a cast on it, no one cared. But as a single mother who's a targeted activist and a journalist, I would literally be running around after my kids, like, watch that step, careful of this, careful of that, don't blah, 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 constantly on at them, be careful, be safe, be careful, be safe, like to a ridiculous degree, because I, something as simple as my kids having an accident and breaking their arm could be used as a pretext to destroy our domestic life and destroy our life together and potentially even separate us. That's the type of pressure that I, and subsequently they, by proxy, had to live under um, as targets. Going into exile is, there are whole other layers to that. There is, um, there's the obvious isolation. Sorry. There is incredible isolation. There was incredible isolation that we face because we lost we lost our family, access to our family, we lost all of our friends, we lost our entire support network in terms of social support network and our personal community. My kids lost their friends, their belongings, which are still to this day sit in storage in New Zealand because I don't know even whether I'll gain per, per, uh, temporary residency here and be able to move them, move their stuff to them. They lost their home that they grew up in. They lost the ability to learn and to speak their native language like every other child in New Zealand does.
they lost the carefree and the carefree and attentive um, parent that I was to them when it was just us in New Zealand. Um, I used to be fun and have fun with them in ways that I had no ability to do since because I am constantly need focused. I have to live in a way that's need focused. I have to make sure that we still have a place to live in, still have a country to live in, still have an apartment to live in, make sure that we have food, make sure that we have clothes, make sure that we have all of the necessities and to do so without anyone around me to facilitate any of that happening. And that means I'm not fun mum, I'm stressed mum almost all the time. And that has been horrendous. And then you add on to that the language barrier and the fact that none of us spoke the language. And then you add on to that the fact that I'm constantly probed and constantly, and I don't mean probed by Russians or locals, I'm not. I've had no interference at all from Russians. But I am constantly probed um, by intel agents and all of the spaces in which I try to communicate or operate relentlessly. They want information however they can get it. They want to insert people in my life and get people close to me. Um, I had to cope with that physically in the real world in New Zealand, but I have to cope with it in digital spaces all of the time. Um, And so... I really, my way of coping with isolation was to overwork. And so in 2017, Internet Party Campaign and 2018, Unity for Jay, I worked every second and every moment that I wasn't with the kids day and night. I did 20 hours days every day. I worked so hard that I would look out the window and the light would burn my eyes looking at daylight would burn my eyes and blind me. That was how I coped with um, with the situation, was just to work and work and work. And then, of course, my body started to give out on me because nobody can work 20-hour days, seven days a week, forever and ever and ever. So that is why I stepped down from Unity for Jay and that's why I took a bit of a break at the beginning of this year And my one accomplishment in recent times is that I have actually hauled my ass back to the gym and started getting in physical shape again and started trying to improve my health by necessity because I can't help anyone, let alone my kids, if I I don't do that, if I don't make that effort and do that. So the reason that I'm talking about these things tonight is because I've been feeling so heartbroken and so vulnerable And I have really nobody to talk about this stuff with. And I remembered, I remembered something. So behind the scenes, I also, I used to never really talk in a personal context about Julian or WikiLeaks or anything else, but I'm starting to change my mind on some of this stuff. So I can tell you that behind the scenes, I was, um, I was, pretty much campaigning for years for Julian Assange to talk more in the public realm about what he was suffering through, what he was going through Um, physically and mentally and emotionally. I thought that it was really important for people to understand how dire his situation was because Recently, you've heard about this, you know, since he's been silenced, you've heard a lot about it. Um, But in the previous years, Julian had really presented himself, I'm not, not even sure deliberately, but he presented himself as being pretty invulnerable and like a Superman. Um, And people looked at him like a superhero. And they didn't understand the reality of what he was suffering through every single day. Nobody really understood that because the decline in his health isn't something that has just happened since the hideous Moreno government. 
it's been going on for the entire decade. Julian was suffering in 2010. He was suffering in 2011. He was suffering in 2012. He was suffering in 2013. But nobody really understood the ways in which he was suffering. So after I um, made the suggestion a number of times, Julian did actually release his medical records. And that was a significant moment. And it was a very Julian way to address the issue because he provided document, you know, documented facts from accredited professionals to um, disclose information about himself that could then be referenced um, by journalists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was definitely a Julian way to handle it, and it was a good way to handle it. But Julian, like many of our men, and I would say Ed also, yeah, you're one of the people who is also guilty of this. Our men um, don't like to be vulnerable, and particularly when they know that their adversaries are high, the highest level adversaries in the world who will exploit any weakness and who will exploit any vulnerability. They don't like to show vulnerability. Our, our men don't like to show vulnerability. And they like to project strength and they like to attract people to themselves through um, invulnerability and, and strength and being powerful. Um, a lot of people tell me all the time that I'm really strong. And it puzzles me because I don't feel strong. I haven't really felt strong through any of this. I've kind of just been in a constant state of having to attempt to deal with what's happening to me in real time as it's happening. I've never felt particularly strong, but people constantly tell me I am strong. And I think it's because they, they confuse the strength of my convictions with some type of personal invulnerability or superpower. And I'm telling you, I'm definitely not invulnerable and I definitely don't have some superpower. And I'm also hyper aware that those who target us know full well how miserable we are sometimes, how much stress we're going through, how hideous what we're going through is. They know that because they spy on us. They were, as we now know, they were spying on Julian every second of every day in every room, including the bathroom, and broadcasting it live to Langley, Virginia, to CIA headquarters. So they knew how Julian was suffering. They watch, they watch and study the effects on us targets of what they do to us. We are like lab rats to them. They will tailor their targeting of other people based on the impacts that they gauge from monitoring the effects of what they have done to us. So what use is it for us to hide from the people who do love us and do support us and do care about us? What use is it to hide our suffering and what we're going through? I think it's not very much use at all. And so that's why I've been, that's what brought me to the decision to try and, and tell you a little bit. I mean, it's just, that's just a tiny window that I gave you tonight, a little bit of what we go through. If you've ever had someone really highly manipulative in your life who lies to you, for an extended period of time and lies to you about fundamental things which relate to why you even chose to engage in any type of relationship with them in the first place, you'll understand that when you inevitably find out the truth, which you always do, that you feel like they stole a piece of your life from you. Because if they had told you the truth up front, you would have made different decisions. Um, that's how I feel about this entire process of being targeted. And it's how I feel about my children and my family as well. I feel like years of our lives were stolen, have been stolen and arguably still are being stolen. 
had they not done to us what they did, I would never even become an investigative journalist. I would never have become any type of expert in the insane and disgusting things that they do to us every day. They created me in that sense. They created my investigative journalism. They created my activism by waking me up to the evils that they do. Okay. Some person <laughs> of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of chat messages that I can see scrolling up my screen right now, some person just said, Assange has been lying to us about 9-11. Maybe now I can stop crying because instead of feeling sorry for myself, I can go into defense mode. And defense mode, if there's one thing I actually really love, it's defending good people. I love standing up for and defending good people. So let's just cover this off really quickly. Julian Assange has published more information about 9-11 than almost anybody on this planet. You can read that information for yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you can read this information for yourself on WikiLeaks. He published the 9-11 page um, transcripts. That means every single emergency alert page response on 9-11 on is published on WikiLeaks. That means you can go and read the real-time inside story of what was going on on 9-11 on WikiLeaks. Basically, nobody ever talks about this, but it's there. There is, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but there's probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of messages from first responders on 9-11 published on WikiLeaks. And if that's not good enough for you, then just type 9-11 into WikiLeaks and there is unbelievable amounts of content from State Department cables, from diplomatic documents about 9-11. Now, someone's saying, have I heard what he said answering questions about 9-11? Yeah, I have. I've seen the video and I've read the, the quote. Now, the video and the quote are two different things. You will notice if you go and watch them. For example, the Irish Examiner, I believe it was off the top of my head, or it was definitely an Irish um, paper, took, pulled one sentence that Julian Assange set out and used, and it has been used forevermore as this pretext of Julian is, uh, uh, doesn't believe in 9-11 truth, blah, 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 blah. What he said was that he didn't want, he was asked about 9-11, which in itself, this is a question every activist asks because it's a loaded question because you get screwed no matter how you answer. If Julian says, yes, I'm on board with 9-11 truth, then every journalist says, Julian Assange is a 9-11 conspiracy theorist. And if Julian says, no, I'm on board with the official story, then the whole 9-11 truth movement and all the activists get told, Julian Assange believes the official story about 9-11. So no matter which way he answered that question, he was going to be screwed by the answer. Now, what he actually said, if you go and watch the video of that interview, is he said, we have published 10 million documents on WikiLeaks, which are verified fact. So instead of asking me about something which we don't yet know one way or the other with 100% documented fact, please focus on the documented facts we do have, i.e. war crimes and God knows what else is in there, is in WikiLeaks files. Please, can we keep the focus on that? Can we keep the focus on what we've actually published? Now, that's a perfectly reasonable answer. He wasn't taking a position one way or the other. He wasn't saying 9-11 official story is correct. And he wasn't saying, uh, you know, Israel burned down the towers or, or whatever the hell else. So I do not, it's just been used as a smear ever since I had the same thing happen to me. I mean, I was asked in an interview, every activist I know gets asked in this in an interview. I was asked in an interview, what do you think about 9-11? And I said, it is pretty damn clear to me that there is a lot of holes in the official narrative and a lot of questions that need to be answered. And sure enough, 
major New Zealand media platforms, Susie is a 9-11 conspiracy theorist, blah, 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 blah. So these questions are just set up as a pretext to divide and conquer. They are trying to divide the support base. So every time I hear Assange and 9-11, I ask myself, this person who's so interested in what Assange thinks about 9-11, have they actually typed 9-11 into WikiLeaks? Have they actually read the thousands of source documents about 9-11 on WikiLeaks? If they haven't, then why is it that they're more concerned about what Assange thinks about 9-11 than they are about finding out what documented truth is available on WikiLeaks about 9-11? And thank you. I'm going to use that as a segue to stop talking about the emotional stuff and to move into the actual content of um, tonight's program. Thank you for bearing with me through that, all of that. So Understanding World War Three is an article that I wrote in 2016. I wrote it after a, um, a lot of study and research on the topic. Um, the, one of the most interesting factors, I think, about this article, and I'll just quickly show it to you here, it's on contraspin.co.nz, is the date that I published it on. I published it on October 17th, 2016. So why that day is so interesting is that while pretty much the entire Western media was in full-blown 2016 election Trump versus Clinton, Coke versus Pepsi mode, um, I wasn't writing about Coke versus Pepsi, Trump versus Clinton. I was writing about the ongoing World War III because it was patently obvious to me that World War III is not only happening, but it's been happening for a long time. And that the only missing piece to that is for the governments, particularly Western governments, but the major governments around the world to acknowledge that World War III is happening to actually declare the war. So what I'm going to do with you tonight is, and just to take this back to the five eyes, in previous episodes of the show, you saw me talk about the role of the intelligence agencies and the kill chain behind the dropping of every single bomb. And I made the argument that to be anti-war, you must be anti-intelligence agencies because the intelligence agencies are both remotely through their networks, but also physically on the ground in war zones, um, supporting and being an inherent part of the process by which every bomb is dropped. In that vein, we know that the intelligence agencies are also the major fiscal benefactor, financial benefactor of war. So when there is armed conflict, the budgets go up, they get more money, they get more leeway and they get more leverage, they get greater resource and ability to do whatever the hell they want to do. We also um, talked, yes, yeah, someone's asking, what is it? It's on contraspin.co.nz and it is called Understanding World War Three. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through the article for you, but I'm also going to ad lib. So I'm not just going to read straight off the page, but I'm actually going to discuss the concepts in it. And I'm going to make this case and explain to you why I believe that World War Three is already underway. The other preface that I would just put before I start going through the article with you is that um, in it, I study the lead up, the period of time prior to the declaration of World War II. And then I compare those events directly to what has been happening in this lead up to and beginning of World War III. Um, I want to be really clear that I get, I, I am not at all someone who likes this callous tossing about of the term Nazi, Nazis, fascist, fascism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it's irresponsible the way that some people have engaged in that and done it. And I hate that um, people get branded with it just because they have some kind of uh, difference of opinion or political opinion or ideology or whatever else. I think it's, um, I think it's another tool of divide and conquer. I think um, accusations of white supremacy get used as a tool of a divide and conquer. 
That's not to say there aren't actual white supremacists on this planet. There absolutely are ideological white supremacists. But they are nowhere near as prevalent as is claimed by certain quarters. And I would also like to point out that there is a long history of intelligence agencies. Someone just said it's like crying wolf. That's exactly right. It is like crying wolf. Um, there is also a long documented history of intelligence agencies using accusations of Nazism or white supremacy to divide and conquer activist groups and movements. So um, that's another thing to be aware of is that it's a, it's, um, a tool for divisiveness. That said, there were actual Nazis on this planet and they did absolutely provoke a world war. And we're going to look at some of the similarities in the geopolitics and in the engagements that led up to that declaration of World War II by comparison to what's happening now. So we will get started, my friends. And by the way, if I run out of voice, which is entirely possible, then I will take a three-minute break. Um, and have a drink and try and get it back and, and um, continue on with you. And then once we get through the article, do a little question and answer or a Q&A session with you. Um, just to give you a heads up, I know there are people who want uh, holding out for the surveillance teaching, which I promised, where we're going to go through every single method of surveillance that I'm aware of, public surveillance, physical surveillance, um, digital surveillance, all the different types of surveillance. We will spend two or three hours just mapping out a big picture of all of the different methods of surveillance. We'll probably do that next Sunday night. And then I think we're going to have a very special guest who I won't name yet in the following week, in two weeks' time. Um, and we're going to study the JTRIG files, which is the... Uh, Joint Threat Research Intelligence Group from GCHQ, which is the UK uh, Eye of the Five Eyes, which was revealed in the Snowden files. And the JTRIG documents are extremely important because they are all about the specific targeting methods of the intelligence, Five Eyes intelligence agencies as pertains to people they consider to be threats and it primarily in an online environment. So it's all about like online digital infiltration of uh, groups and networks. It's specifically about how to smear a target, um, how to destroy a life um, through online means. And uh, those uh, documents were all based on psychology, psycholo uh, psychology principle, principles of psychology, I should say, um, and are highly technical. So I am bringing in an expert to decipher some of that lingo for us and then some activists to talk about the ways in which those principles have been used to target them and to destabilize their lives and, and to harm them in, in real ways in the real world. Um, so that's what's the program for the next two weeks. Okay, without any further ado, actually I'll do it the other way around. I'm going to have a quick drink now and I'll be back in two minutes and we will work our way through understanding World War Three. Uh, all my awesome mods, if you could circulate the link to the article, that would be really cool and then people can go through the material at the same time as we discuss it. Be right back.
Um, and that is because of what is happening in Ecuador at the moment. So the Ecuadorian people are resisting Lenin Moreno's government, who has been imposing the IMF austerity and privatization of an agenda, which has already affected so many countries around the world, including, in fact, little, very few people realize this, but including, in fact, my own home country of New Zealand, um, also known as neoliberal economics. Um, the privatisation agenda meant that from roughly the end of the 80s through until the current day, New Zealand lost ownership of all of its critical infrastructure. So, and uh, most of, nearly all of its state assets. So that meant we don't own our railways, we don't own our telecommunications companies anymore, we don't own our... Um, our power companies, we don't own, we, many, many of our state assets were privatized and sold off. And the austerity agenda means cuts to public services. Uh, so the shutting of many um, organizations that supported the public and provided critical social services. Um, and this is an agenda that was rolled out really across, the, I'd say, all of the Western world. Um, you see it in Britain, you see it and definitely see it in America. It was also coupled with trade agreements, which spelled the death of local manufacturing um, and the importation of cheap, um, defective goods uh, from third world countries, where obviously child labor and even slavery were being practiced. And uh, until very recently, until just a couple of years ago, Ecuador was free of the IMF and free of the military industrial complex of the Western nations. But unfortunately, with the election of Lenin Moreno, who was elected on a leftist agenda and was supposed to preserve the sovereignty of Ecuador, um, got straight into bed with some really dark uh, right-wing forces in Ecuador and began the economic destabilization of the country. So the protesters who have been, I'd say, nearly by the millions, if not by the millions, over the last couple of days protesting in Quito and in other cities in Ecuador have been met with not only riot police and all of the riot ordinance, the tear gas and the everything else, the so-called less lethal weapons, which are all too lethal when they're fired on you at short range, they also have had the military unleashed on them. So there have been actual tanks and soldiers firing live rounds, uh, killing protesters in Ecuador. And sadly, but unsurprisingly, the Western media have been completely silent about that or have just made it out like it's some fringe protests about fuel prices and failed to mention that people are getting shot in the head and killed by the military in Ecuador. Um, if you have a look on my timeline on Twitter at Suzy3D, S-U-Z-I number three letter D, and you scroll back over the last two days, I've been constantly sharing live video from people on the ground showing the one-sided war that is being inflicted by the Ecuadorian military onto its own citizens in Ecuador. Now, in these types of situations, it is there is a long history of intelligence agencies, and particularly the, uh, the CIA, getting involved or being involved from the outset. And generally, the pattern that is followed is that they will pump weapons and money sometimes to both sides. Um, the Syrian conflict originally started out with genuine anti, uh, uh, gen genuine pro-democratic anti-Syrian government protests in uh, 2011 and early 2012. Guns and money were, were poured into um, and infiltrating mercenaries were poured into that conflict and it became a... Civil, I don't even like calling it a civil war, actually, because of the extent of the foreign influence um, that really engineered that situation, um, but essentially a civil war. And the devastation that's been wreaked, uh, wreaked in Syria across this decade uh, had its provenance in that. Now, my concern is that while the protesters currently don't have arms and aren't shooting back, that um, Ecuador looks to me like it could be set up to become a similar scenario. And it also looks like it could eventually become a proxy war. 
And we're going to talk a lot about proxy wars shortly as we look into this article. So I'm going to screen share and we're going to get started. Okay, here we go. Understanding World War Three, October 17th, 2016. A critical look at history reveals that World War II started in 1933 and not 1939. And um, World War III, if it is ever declared, also won't have started at the declaration point of the war. It will have started long before, as you'll see in the analysis in this article. With the invocation of a state of war and the granting of war powers to the head of state, Nazi Germany was emboldened to begin their rampage of propaganda-fueled totalitarianism and ultimately invasion, mass murder, and assimilation. So this granting of war powers and the invocation of a state of war is exactly what we saw post 9-11 when Bush declared the global war on terror and then extended the AUMF which we'll get into a little bit further along as well, to enable them to wage this war on terror. The official World War II commencement date of 1st September 1939 marks the day that England and France declared war and began openly militarily opposing Germany's aggressive and expansionist agenda. It is the date that officials were finally allowed to confirm to the public who were subsequently engaged and drafted to support it that there was in fact a world war going on. And this is my entire point here, is that just because the officials finally declare war doesn't mean that the war hasn't already been happening. But with a slew of countries already having been breached by invading armies, World War II had begun well prior to the public acknowledgement of it. Similarly, World War III will not be determined by the history books to have officially begun until a country or a coalition of countries formally stand to oppose and or declare war against the now long campaign of invasion, subversion and international destabilization perpetrated by the United States and their allies. But nonetheless, even in the absence of such proclamations, World War III is well underway. That fact is only now filtering through to the awareness of the global public. My analysis of the 1933 to 1939 period in Germany's history has grave implications. The diplomatic and military conduct of Nazi Germany eerily mirrors that of the USA, hereafter colloquially described as the US empire, in the period 2001 to 2016. The events leading up to World War II and World War III are scarily similar. And then I talk about Naomi Klein's, uh, Klein's 10 Steps to Fascism, being otherization, the creation of an enemy, um, operating gulags such as Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay, uh, para, employing paramilitary, outsourced military or the privatization of military, um, immunized thuggery, which is black water, etc. Now, when I the immunized part here uh, refers to um, Donald Rumsfeld's total force doctrine, which is where he immunized private military companies from being able to be prosecuted for any wrongdoing. He extended the immunization that the U.S. Army and U.S. Armed Forces have to the private sector, which is obviously incredibly problematic. The employment of domestic surveillance, which would be like NSA and facial recognition systems, etc., all the types of things that Snowden and others have talked about. Arbitrary detention, which would be like TSA, like arbitrary detention, how you can be detained at the border for eight hours, no legal representation, no charges against you, etc., etc., the subversion of media, which was a huge factor in how um, the Nazis were able to do what they were doing domestically and get away with it. The abuse of the definition in terms of espionage and treason. Well, Jesus, we've seen that, haven't we? John Kiriakou being um, charged with espionage for revealing the fact that crimes against humanity were being uh, perpetrated by the CIA. And legislative suspension of the rule of law, which is pretty much exactly what NDAA has been about each year for most of this decade, being the National Defense Authorization Act in America. 
But this article will go beyond that to look not just at the general trends and conditions, but to directly compare the chronology of the specific acts of Nazi Germany with those of the modern day US empire in the context of World War II and the now well underway World War III. The Naked Agenda. The most nefarious of acts are not the dastardly deeds waged covertly in secret, but those executed publicly in plain sight and then employed on a massive scale. So it's the things that they actually tell us about and even brag about that are even more concerning than what is happening in secret. Because there is plenty that they openly brag about that is highly problematic and that's a massive understatement. Hitler, from the documentary World War II, Germany Road to War, Hitler never made a secret of his aims. He committed them to print and repeated them in countless speeches. He triumphed because the world was blind to the signals he constantly raised. Time and time again, Hitler could have been stopped by his fellow Germans first and by foreign leaders later. Not until 1939 did the Allied leaders move to contain him, and by then it was too late to block his road to war. Time and time again, over the last 15 years, the empire has declared that it is at war. This isn't something they've hidden. They've said, we are at war. This is a war. The world is a battlefield. This is a global war on terror. They proclaimed that there would be multiple theatres of operation. That was exactly the words they used that their enemies were numerous and would be hunted wherever they resided or roamed. Remember George W. Bush? Wherever you are on this planet, we will find you. We will hunt you down. There will be no borders in this war. I mean, yet somehow we didn't take it seriously enough. Numbed to the overblown rhetoric of Western leaders, because they are absolutely overblown in their speech, it never quite sunk into the global public that America declaring a state of emergency, invoking war powers, dramatically expanding military capabilities and financing, employing legions of mercenaries, invading a string of foreign nations, upending elected governments, occupying foreign lands, incurring civilian casualties into the millions, creating a massive refugee crisis and incessantly lying about their motives for it was in fact them instigating a third world war. Because when you look at everything that they did in totality, in its totality, is that not a war? I mean, they told us this is a war. <laughs> Warning signs. The subversion of constitutions and democratic principles is a common thread among all tyrants, dictators, and military regimes, and we're absolutely seeing that in Ecuador right now. When a permanent state of emergency, which Moreno has just declared a state of emergency, was declared in Germany and the Enabling Act of 1933 passed, the stage was set for unending war. So in 1933, the, ground, the legislative groundwork was already in place for World War II. Well, but the public didn't know it was World War II until 1939, remember. While different in letter and inferior in scope to the far more complex USA Patriot Act of 2003, the ultimate aims were similar. To enhance the powers of the Nazi government to engage in internecine warfare on a whim. Internecine in terms of Europe. Likewise, according to Wikipedia, probably the worst source ever, but we'll still cite it for this particular case, in the wake of the September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks in the United States, the Bush administration asserted both a right and the intention to wage preemptive war or preventative war. This became the basis for the Bush doctrine. So those were exactly the premises of the Nazis War Powers Act, were to assert a right to wage preemptive war. The Nazis soon used their powers to justify the execution and imprisonment of their own people. Now, just bear in mind, we think, oh, we don't execute, you know, execute people. Well, this isn't just like jailing them and putting them on death row. This is like drone executions of American citizens on foreign soil, extrajudicially without them ever being arrested or charged or going to a court, through a court process. And this is manifest in the recent conduct of the empire also. 
2012's National Defence Authorization Act famously included provisions for the indefinite detention without trial of American citizens and US citizens have become targets of extrajudicial killings by their own governments. The stated justification? George Bush's 2001 authorization to use military force of the known as the AUMF. On 14 September 2001, Congress declared that the AUMF was intended to constitute specific statutory authorization within the meaning of Section 5B of the War Powers Resolution of 1973. And, and this is a quote, an initial draft of Senate Joint Resolution 23 included language granting the power to deter and preempt any future acts of terrorism or aggression against the United States. Members were concerned that this would provide a blank check to go anywhere, anytime, against anyone, the Bush administration, or any subsequent administration deemed capable of carrying out an attack, and the language was removed. Constitutional law specialist Professor Bruce Ackerman of Yale Law School has said the Obama's administration use of the AUMF has so far overstepped the authorized powers of the final enacted version of the bill, as to more closely resemble the capabilities named in the draft text rejected by Congress. So now you have a presidential administration acting on law that is not law. This is definitive proof that laws passed to expand the power of the executive are carried over to subsequent administrations and then employed as justifications and expanded upon to devastating effect. So Obama becomes but Bush did it and Trump becomes, but Obama did it and so on and so forth through administration after administration. Wikipedia states that critics of the, and for those of you saying, oh, but Trump didn't do it. Trump has like not gotten us into another war. One of the first things that Trump did when he got into office was declare that the CIA could make its own decisions around the uh, extrajudicial drone assassination program. And if you go back and read the original things, he decided he didn't want anything, Trump didn't want anything to do with that. He didn't want to have kill this Tuesday like Obama had and sign off on the drone killings. <coughs> but he was actually fine for the CIA just to handle it all themselves. So this is something that's very seldom acknowledged about Trump is that he actually, from the outset of his administration, increased the scope of powers of the CIA, in particular in relation to um, foreign drone programs, Wikipedia, which are executed from US soil, I might add. Wikipedia states that critics of the Bush Doctrine were suspicious of the increasing willingness of the United States to use military force unilaterally. Robert W. Tucker and David C. Hendrickson argued that it reflects a turn away from international law and marks the end of American legitimacy in foreign affairs. Both Nazi Germany and the US empire share the trait of justifying their non-compliance with international law and treaties by manufactured legal caveat to enable the abdication of their democratic responsibilities. And just taking this back to the five eyes as well, this is something that um, we see with the five eyes routinely, which is that the string of bills and acts and legislation that have been passed to expand the resources and powers of the intelligence agencies throughout this decade in particular, are total, in total violation of certainly international law, universal declaration of human rights, et cetera, but also to our own domestic bill of rights. So their laws are violating other laws and they don't care at all in the slightest. Germany claimed that international treaties were not adhered to by their political adversaries and therefore it need not uphold or be bound by them. Now, where have we heard that before? The US has completely abandoned international law in recent, if not, I'd say the last 20 years in particular. And also this goes back to, it goes back to my earlier point too um, in the article about what they do openly is actually almost scarier than what they do in secret because they have made no secret of uh, pulling support, uh, refusing participation in international tri tribunals, refusing to respect international law, res uh, refusing to uh, respect decisions by international bodies to which they're signatories. Um, this, is, oh, this is done overtly and openly. It's not at all something that they make a secret out of.
the same argument has been made by Western powers about everything from the Kyoto Protocol to torture. Another similarity is the self-righteous contempt for established covenants governing the military conduct of nations. In 2002, the United States openly stated it would not abide by the Geneva Conventions on the treatment of prisoners of war. Likewise, Nazi Germany's failure to abide by the 1929 conventions have been thoroughly documented. So once again, they're just openly refusing to abide by fundamental pieces of international law like the Geneva Conventions. Peace is an endlessly abused idealistic, idealistic concept. Actually, we can probably skip this, otherwise this is going to take too long. So this entire section is about how um, war gets dressed up as peace by these diplomats and politicians who are advocating war. They always do it in the name of peace. And Obama was, so in Hitler's speeches, he would declare he's going to do all this evil shit and he'd say that he's doing it in the name of peace. Um, likewise, uh, Obama did the same thing. In 2009, President Obama fam famously droned on for over 30 minutes about peace in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize. This despite his administration having dramatically advanced the prevalence and use of obscene high-tech methods of achieving extrajudicial killings and extension. He went further than that which was employed in George W. Bush's hegemonic and interventionist foreign policy. Conquest in stages is another, another similarity uh, between uh, world, the lead up to World War II and the ongoing World War III. The obsession with strategic, uh, strategic planning reassures these guys of their longevity, yet their thirst for victory and conquest is never sated. Remember George W. Bush standing on that destroyer and saying, mission accomplished? Uh, and then how long was it before they were into the next country and the next country and the next country? War is an addiction for them. Once the cogs of war are greased in emotion, they become trapped in a cycle of their own inertia. Inevitably, the velocity they generate speeds them towards their undoing. They haven't accomplished any mission other than perpetual war. Nazi Germany's trail of subjugation forged across Central Europe back-to-back -back unopposed and largely bloodless successes bolstered its aspirations to impose dominion over the greater Western European continent. The further that aim progressed, the more murderous the campaign. Ultimately, this brought them to the doorstep of the seat of power in the USSR, as well as into the North Atlantic Maritime Channel to the British Isles. Photo photographs of Hitler's command show him and his generals poring over a map reminiscent of a plus-size replica of the board game Risk. Risk is a great analogy for how war planners see war. To them, it is not the stark reality of their lawlessness, the blood and bone, murder and rape, mass displacement. It is a map upon which is determined the geographical control, monopolization, distribution, and ownership of resources. This, is all, this also really, really applies to the intelligence agencies. The vast majority of the employees of the intelligence agencies aren't out there involved in killings or uh, human intelligence operations or whatever else. The vast majority of them are sitting in offices with PowerPoint presentations. Um, they are having corporate meetings. They are working on <laughs> fudging budgets or writing bullshit reports for Congress. They are involved in uh, spying on or monitoring targets from afar. They are not in there with a sword on horseback leading the charge on the front lines. You know, they'd, they'd love to think that they are. In fact, they love to employ analogies to suggest that they are some digital version of a frontline warrior uh, to make them feel like they they are really have their hands dirty and, and are at the coal face but they're not they have total and utter detachment from the havoc that they wreak and then they are also voyeurs so i mean you see i'm thinking about manning talking about um, people sitting around and watching videos like what became the WikiLeaks collateral murder video. Uh, like it's a sport, like it's a video game, like it's a, a form of entertainment. Um, one of the things that made me sick about this whole Turkey and Kurd um, situation in Syria at the moment is knowing that at the National Geospatial Agency, 
there will be intelligence operatives who are literally watching the Turkish incursion into Syria on live stream the way that we watch live streams on YouTube, right? But they're doing it from their spy satellites and everything else. And they will literally sit there and watch the mortars and the bombs and the tank movements and people being shot and people being killed and people being raped and towns being burned to the ground. They will sit there and watch it like it's a reality TV show. And that detachment is really, really, really dangerous. But back to the article. Um, I won't go through the general Wesley Clark stuff because I'm pretty sure that everybody knows about that which was that there was a plan to invade a string of countries and sure enough that's come to fruition with the exception of Iran which is now the the final um, pillar left standing that they had intended to go after all along since 9-11. Their plan is not about democracy or security or fighting terrorism, the plan is about control. Just like Nazi Germany which also wasn't about democracy, security, or fighting terrorism. There was nobody invading Germany. There was nobody invading the Nazis when they started invading the whole of Europe. It was all just bullshit pretext, and that's exactly what we see with US empire. Um, just like Nazi Germany and many other empires before them, they simply want to rule the world. And these intelligence agencies literally admit in their own documents that they want total they want to be able to see every square inch on the globe. They want to make, be able to maintain total control. Each conquest becomes a launch pad for the next. And my God, if you don't see that in Syria, I don't know what you do. Where did the incursions into Syria come from? Where did the drugs and the money, uh, sorry, the weapons and the money come from? They came from Iraq. Iraq became the staging area for the Syrian war. And if they'd been successful in Syria, undoubtedly Syria would have become the staging zone for an invasion of Iran. The invasion of Iraq allowed the United States to establish bases and to prepare itself for conflict in Syria. The invasion of Poland allowed Nazi Germany to establish bases and fortifications to prepare itself for a ground invasion of the USSR. Nowadays, Ukraine is the new Poland. That's what Ukraine is about. Ukraine isn't about Ukraine. Ukraine isn't about just dealing a blow to Russia. Ukraine is about creating a staging area, creating a lily pad, as the um, US likes to call its intermediary countries where it runs its drone operations and everything else out of. Ukraine is about creating a staging area for a theoretical invasion of Russia or a conflict with Russia. The disbandment of the invaded nation's military is another theme. And remember, they did that in Iraq, just as the Iraqi army was famously and disastrously dismantled post-invasion. Nazi Germany disbanded the Czech army and others. Stress factors for ethnic and religious tensions are deliberately exacerbated as target countries are purposefully divided along sectarian lines by their invaders. Now, I had friends in Iraq, and they told me in no uncertain terms there was no sectarian issues in Iraq prior to the invasion of Iraq, despite the fact that the Sunni and Shia sects um, do have some, which they actually considered relatively minor religious differences, relatively minor within the microcosm of Iraq pre uh, in pre-most recent invasion. Um, there was no social segregation amongst the common population along religious or sectarian lines. That was deliberately exploited by the US uh, to create that sectarian warfare. It was an absolute divide and conquer destabilization agenda. The preconditions for civil war are maximized and this is another thing that I worry about happening in Ecuador now, to provide further justification for ongoing occupation. So once again, it's about creating pretext to create bad guys and four guys and to prevent any cohesive opposition from forming or taking hold. This invariably leads to sectarian warfare. This tactic is simple, divide and conquer. 
both Nazi Germany and the US empire demonstrated the effectiveness of that strategy over and over again. So another thing that enabled World War II and that is also enabling World War III is the inaction by the international community. In World War II, the Allied powers failed to act again and again. They did not act against Hitler when he positioned his troops in the Rhineland, nor when he occupied Austria. Uh, from John declared on net, in 1936, Hitler moved his troops into the demilitarized zone, claiming that the recent treaty between France and Russia threatened Germany's safety. His commanders had orders to retreat if the French army tried to stop them, but this time it was France who did nothing. The League of Nations, busy with the Abyssinian crisis, also did nothing. Now, the League of Nations is the precursor to the UN. So this is yet another point that I'm pretty sure I get into this article, which is that each time there is a world war, there is a uh, reshuffling of the international organizations for diplomacy. So the League of Nations was made defunct by World War II. I believe the United Nations will be made defunct by World War III. The following table from, so this guy, John Declare on johndeclare.net gave us this table to explain appeasement policy. And in this table, I'm gonna make it bigger because it's pretty important stuff. He shows the progression in terms of the dates, the years and the areas that were invaded by Germany and what Hitler did and what the internet, how the international community responded. So the first invasion, Britain and France did nothing. The second invasion, British and Britain and France did nothing. The third invasion, Britain and France did nothing. The fourth invasion, they came to terms. The fifth invasion, they said that they would uh, do something. And then the sixth invasion, they finally declared war. So at this point, how many people are dead? and how many countries are destabilized and how much bloodshed has been going on and yet no war had been declared. And this is the fundamental point I'm trying to make here about World War III, is that we've had this series of invasions and we've had the international community sit by and basically watch it happen and we've had no declaration of war. That doesn't mean there isn't a war going on because there was a war going on here and here and here and here and here before anyone in the West was prepared to admit there was a war going on. Modern military campaigns of the empire have until recent times also been largely unopposed. Modeled off the above, here is my own table of recent events. So what I did is I took this, uh, this table that this guy, John D. Clare, had put together, and rather than it being in the 30s about Nazi Germany, I created a version that is post 9-11 and about the actions of the US empire. And again, I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger and hope you can see it. So in 2001, they invaded Afghanistan. It was invaded by the US and allies, including the United Kingdom. And the only meaningful opposition was insurgents, local insurgents. In 2003, they invaded Iraq. It was invaded by US led coalition of the willing, as it was termed. They were imposed only by insurgents. In 2004, in Pakistan, with the cooperation of the Pakistan government, drone operations by the CIA, rather than the military, to avoid sovereignty issues, were opposed only by insurgents in that region. In 2011, Libya was invaded. The US, UK, France, Canada, and 15 smaller nations destroyed Libya. And that's something that needs to be remembered, actually, the 18 countries got on board with the US and are equally culpable for the current state of non-state of Libya, the slave markets and everything else going on there. It's actually not just the US. It was everybody else that didn't have the guts to stand up and say no. They were also opposed only by insurgents. But then things begin to turn. In 2011, in Syria, US-backed proxy militias and other forces engage in combat they are opposed by the Syrian government, supported by Iran, and as of 2015, Russia. So this is the first signs of there starting to be some actual pushback against the invading empire, just like we saw here in the World War II version. 
So we saw here that finally a line was drawn, okay? We'd had four invasions beforehand. Finally, a line is drawn, and then there's a declaration of war. Well, in World War III, we've got one, two, three, four invasions before a line is drawn. And then in 2016, Russia, the US has declared imminent cyber attacks against Russia. And Russia declared that it was prepared to defend itself. So this is at the time that I wrote this article. This is the moment that we were at. Now, also in this moment, and it's not covered in this article, though I definitely, I could probably dig out the files somewhere on my computer. Also in this article we saw, uh, sorry, at this exact time in 2016, just before the presidential election, there was, uh, the US military was posting photos of uniformed American soldiers standing on the border of Estonia and Russia holding up American flags. Uh, thousands of tanks were openly, it was openly reported, thousands of US tanks, um, I believe also NATO tanks, were being shipped into uh, Eastern Europe. So there was an, a, definite, <laughs> a definite military buildup against Russia. Now, whether they'd be stupid enough to go into direct military engagement with Russia is debatable, given the nuclear weapons situation, um, given the historical disaster that previous attempts to invade Russia have been. Um, but they absolutely were hyper-aggressive towards Russia. And this is never, interestingly, this is never discussed or acknowledged in the Russiagate debate. Ever. None of the stuff. In the Russiagate debate, America was doing nothing, minding its own goddamn business, and Russia came along and did this terrible cyber attack on the TNC. I was kind of almost, sorry, I can't stop myself laughing. Our democratic institutions, the DNC. Okay, that's the Russiagate fairy tale. But meanwhile, back in reality, the US empire had been staging provocations against Russia consistently and right up on its borders. Okay, so notably, none of the countries in which the US empire has intervened have actually benefited from it. <clears throat> none of them have resulted in peace, okay? Afghanistan, no peace. Iraq, no peace. Syria, no peace. Libya, no peace. There is no peaceful outcome from any of this. Active conflict remains in all of the above up to the time of this writing. We're sitting here three years later. Active conflict still remains in all of the above. And that's not an accident. It's intentional. There is a glaringly obvious line missing from my table and that is the bottom line of the World War II table the open declaration of war by a nation or nations willing to declare war in direct opposition to the activities of the empire. So what I'm saying there is that all of the preconditions of war, everything that led up to World War II has already happened in World War III. The only piece of the puzzle that's currently missing is the declaration of war, is the yes, this is World War III. That's the only part we're missing. We've had everything else. We've had the campaign of illegal invasions. We've had the institution of legislation uh, to empower these activities. We've had all of the other list of things from Naomi Klein's 10 Steps to Fascism, the mercenaries and the gulags like Guantanamo Bay, et cetera, et cetera. All of that's already done. The only thing that is missing is for it to be acknowledged to the public by the governments that this is what they're up to and this is what they're doing. Propaganda and pretext. Now, this is where we get into journalism and media. The inception of war is always based on propaganda. This is true for each aggressive action undertaken in both World War II and World War III. Nazi propaganda is a thoroughly explored topic. I don't think we even really need to go into that because if you don't know about that, I'd be very, very surprised, but I've recounted a lot of it here. Um, Nazi Germany would vilify, obviously, its enemies, even though its enemies weren't invading them, they were invading their so-called enemies. Um, they would engage in psyops, 
um, claiming to be victims when, of course, they weren't the victims. The U.S. empire uses manufactured intelligence, criticism of the I mean, you can see it with Venezuela, with North Korea, with everybody who they haven't managed to invade yet that they want to invade. They engage in the same type of demonization and psyops. We saw tons of it, <coughs> tons of it in Syria. Another recurring theme for the U.S. is its cyclical doomsday warnings about mortal dangers of weapons of mass destruction. Chemical weapons in Iraq are unacceptable. Chemical weapons in Syria are the red line, but there is little mention or concern for where and how these technologies were supplied to or obtained by the countries possessing them, because guess what? It turns out the chemical weapons actually came from the United States. And that they talk, I talk about Iraq and the Kurds and the chemical weapons there. I think that's something that all of you would know about also. I've investigated the stated justifications of Nazi Germany and of the US empire for each of the military incursions and created the following table. So again, from that original table from John D. Clare, I'm now modeling uh, off that original table, but this time I'm doing it about the justifications for uh, each of the invasions leading up to World War II and leading up to World War III. So in 1936, the invasion of the Rhineland was supposed to, supposedly, this was their stated reason, their excuse basically, was to protect Germany's western border. In 1938, in the Sudetenland, the unification of German peoples, they were bringing their own people together and uniting them. Um, and they had claims of alleged suppression of Germanic people. So they were saying, um, you know, people of Germanic origin are being uh, discriminated against and therefore we need to reunify with them uh, to protect them. They used the same excuse in Austria, then they used the same excuse in Czechoslovakia. But in each of those, they weren't uniting anyone. What they were doing is usurping all of the land of the provenance of the province and then asserting governance, um, mandating governance over it. Then in Poland, they said that again they were protecting Germanic peoples within Polish border who were allegedly fleeing Polish terror, and they said that Pol the Polish were terrorists. And once again, they resulted in usur them usurping all of the land of Poland and uh, asserting governance over Poland and killing a million Polish people in the meantime. And I didn't mention above the further German invasions um, throughout the rest of the war. I just went up to the date the war was actually declared. So now we look at the excuses that the US has come up with for its invasions over the last 20 years. In 2001, Afghanistan was about September 11th because it was supposedly a terrorist safe harbor for Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda. The end result, as of 2016, the country had remained in chaos 15 years later. 2003 in Iraq, it was weapons of mass destruction, removing a dictator and protecting human rights. Outcome? The WMD allegation was proven false, millions of dead and displaced. 2004, Pakistan was about September 11th, terrorist safe harbor for Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Drone stri strikes are ongoing some 12 years later, many dead. And to this day, I believe they're still um, doing drone strikes in the border region. Uh, 2011, Libya was about removing a dictator and protecting human rights. Remember those poor, the, they said those women had been raped. They'd come into the hotel to tell the journalists they'd been raped and that's why we needed to invade Libya. Sure enough, as of 2016, the country remained in total chaos five years later. Now, eight years later, still in total chaos. 2011, Syria was about removing the dictator, Assad, and protecting human rights. But yet again, the country still remains in chaos, millions of dead and displaced. Now, in 2016, that was certainly the case. Um, Russia was only just starting to bolster Syria at that point. In 2019, there is some stable regions of Syria where the Syrian government with um, foreign allies has managed to uh, to create safe zones. 
Um, however, there is still conflict in other parts of the country, obviously. In 2016, their excuse for um, declaring cyber war on Russia was supposed to be in relation uh, to, uh, was supposed to be retaliatory cyber warfare due to the accusation of alleged interference in the US election. The allegations of Russia Gate remain unproven and the outcome is yet to be determined. Of course, for the propaganda of the state to thrive, there must be a wholesale subjugation of the press. This can be achieved economically through mergers and acquisitions of the corporations that own them. It can be accomplished through smear campaigns and career disadvantages for those who refuse to toe the line, and we've seen plenty of that. Also prosecutions. If none of that works, then there is the outright, outright criminalization of the truth and the persecution of those who tell it. And if that isn't Julian Assange, then I don't know what is. Julian Assange was the ultimate truth teller about geopolitics and the state of our world and has been, is being persecuted to death for it. So there's a really interesting case study. I'm just going to tell you the story myself, actually, rather than reading it off the page. There's a really interesting case study um, in Nazi Germany, World War pre, actually pre-World War II times. And that's that um, there is this this uh, publication. <clears throat> there is a publication that was the last, I'll take this off screen here and I'll just tell you the story. Um, it was the last publication in Germany on German soil to openly oppose uh, the Hitler's Nazi regime and to tell the truth about the crimes that were being committed, the extrajudicial killings and the uh, war crimes that were being committed and the crimes of aggression and invasion. Um, it was called the Munich Post, but Hitler hated their guts and Hitler called them the poison kitchen. And they only had about a dozen um, editors and staff working for them but they were documenting the extrajudicial killings of the of citizens by the SS. So think about how brave these people were. And for a dozen years prior to the declaration of war, actually, I think it was, I want to say 21 to 1933 off the top of my head. We could go back and check all the facts are in my article and the link, source links. Um, for 12 years, they were publishing the truth about the rise of Hitler and, and the fascist youth and the SS and uh, the persecution and extrajudicial killings of citizens. And they received threat after threat after threat that they would be shut down, that they, were, that they would be killed even. And they continued to publish. They continued to publish even as their country was terrorized by its government even as the bodies lay in the street, they continued to publish and they refused to stop publishing. And eventually Hitler um, sent the SS to ransack and burn down the offices and to the offices of the, um, of the newspaper and to seize the printing presses, to arrest the journalists and editors and um, some were killed and others were thrown in concentration camps. They are the epitome of what journalism is supposed to be and of what journalists and editors and media are supposed to be. M media is supposed to be a public service. They're supposed to serve the public. They're not supposed to serve corporations. They're not supposed to do what they do for financial reasons or for career advancement reasons. They are supposed to dig out the dark underbelly of whatever is happening in either their local or national or international society and to expose the truth of it for the betterment of humanity and for the benefit of humanity. And that is what the Poison Kitchen did. The Poison Kitchen is the ultimate example of the obligation and responsibility of journalism. So I do actually want to, and I name the I name the people from the Poison Kitchen in the article, and I actually think it's really important to say their names. 
So here we are yeah, right here. It is important that we name the names of the courageous. Tugu continues, protesters to Hitler fought with their hearts and jeopardized their freedom and lives, hoping that the world would listen. Now that is also Ecuador right now. The protesters are begging for the world to listen as the entire Western media sits silent. The men of the Poison Kitchen, the Munich Post, included Martin Gruber, er Erhard Auer, Edmund Goldschag, Julius Zerfass, and others, reporters and editors of the Munich Post. They faced imprisonment and death, trying unsuccessfully to warn the world. And with the passage of time, their truth rings ever stronger. Why does it ring ever stronger? Because they were right. They were right and it cost them their lives and they gave their lives for the benefit of everybody else, trying to warn people, trying to warn the world about what was going on. Even in this modern day, real journalists are often martyred for living up to the ideals of the profession. Yet again, Julian Assange. True journalism is a public service and a service to the historical record to tell the unpopular truth about nefarious power, no matter the risk. While the perilous days of the poison kitchen may seem long behind us, the preconditions for such a reoccurrence surround us. Journalists around the world are being spied on and in many cases illegally monitored by the governments. <clears throat> using high-tech equipment and corresponding laws that were designed for combating terrorism. The death of America, and I'd just like to point something out here. We hear all the time about Trump is so acrimonious to the press and the poor press having to work in this hostile environment and blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry, Trump sending some mean tweets or like saying some mean stuff at a press conference, it's not a fucking patch on what Julian Assange is being put through. But we don't hear, oh, Trump's persecuting Julian Assange. We hear, oh, Trump's being mean to this ABC News anchor or whatever has sent this tweet or like said this at a press conference. No, there are to this day journalists who have either lost their lives or whose lives are on the line, who stand to die for providing truth and accurate journalism for the benefit of humanity. Let's say the names. Julian Assange is at the top of the list. Top of the list. Now, talking about say, saying the names, the death of American journalist Serena Shim and the lack of investigation into her passing, the jailing of citizen journalists who eyewitnessed police killings of unarmed citizens, the siege of WikiLeaks editor-in-chief Julian Assange, the litigation that brought Gorka Media to its knees, the arrest and detention of Democracy Now's Amy Goodman, and the felony charges against a documentary producer at No DAPR, which was the Dakota Access Pipeline protest, where, once again, mercenary police forces unleash munitions upon the civilian population of the United States, um, are all dire warnings that we might not be so far away from an escalation to internment camps, arbitrary detention, and open military conflict as we might like to think. And if that seems far away, this is 2016. Internment camps, arbitrary detention, sound familiar? An open military conflict is what we are already seeing in the Middle East. At any given time, the U.S. empire has an ace in their pocket, for as they are well aware, bringing the press to heel can also be achieved most potently by harnessing galvanizing events such as perceived attacks upon the country, as with the Reichstag fire in 1933 or the Gulf of Tonkin naval incident at the start of the Vietnam War. The culpability for these incidents can often lie a lot closer to home than the establishment ever lets on. And then I go through and give an example of a PSYOP, um, a PSYOP to the benefit of Saudi Arabia and against Yemen, yeah, it was Yemen, that occurred in 2016, which people have probably now already forgotten about. If you want to read about that, you can um, have a look at this article, consciousman.co.nz, and put in the search, Understanding World War Three. To save us some time, we're not going to go through it now. And then I talk again about um, the inception of the Vietnam War being based on a false flag. Okay, so yet another um, another aspect, another similarity between the lead up to World War II and this world, ongoing World War III is um, 
use waging war at home. So in December 2012, G. Johnson, the General Counsel for the Department of Defense, stated that the military fight will be replaced by a law enforcement operation when speaking at Oxford his, uh, University. Throughout history, the United States has used counterintelligence tactics to wage war against its own citizens when they congregate en masse to exercise democratic rights. But particularly since 2011, there has been a dramatic increase in the prevalence of military-grade equipment flowing to police forces and brutal physical oppression meted out against demonstrators and occupiers. While it was assumed to be a, a profit-driven consequence of the privatization of key aspects of the military or just harsh policing tactics, there is now evidence that stormtrooper-like riot police serving as a domestic army is in alignment with the strategic plans of the Department of Defense. And then I cite a video that was released by the Intercept in 2016. You need to watch this video. It's an internal Department of De uh, Defense video. And in it, and I'm again, I'm going to skip through this for the sake of time, because this is like a 10,000 word article and we'll be here all night if I try and read every single word of it. But in that, um, and then I have an, a time-stamped analysis of the article, but the, uh, oh, sorry, of the video. The gist of the video is that the Department of Defense is outright stating that the future of warfare is urban, and it's urban in terms of the Western world, and that it will be waged by our soldiers in the future army, they say, redefining doctrine in the force, while showing hordes of uh, riot cops in military gear. So these riot cops that we saw used against Occupy and other protest movements, and like we're seeing in Ecuador right now, are envisioned by the Department of Defense as being not police, but soldiers, and being the future army that will police urban areas on American soil. Now, if that doesn't scare the shit out of you, I don't know what does. Like, your military has basically decided, oh, yeah, we can't roll around the streets as the military. So what we do is we take the police forces and we kit them out, like, as if they're military. And then we get a bunch of ex-military guys and get them recruited into law enforcement. And then, voila, we have a military, but people don't recognize it as a military. They recognize it as being domestic police forces. But in fact, it's the military, military equipment, military personnel, according to the military's own strategic plan. That should seriously scare the shit out of you guys. And it's already in place and it is already happening. Sorry, I just got my Zoom share back up. So that's the gist of that video, and I suggest you watch it. The video itself is freaking terrifying, quite frankly. Um, and then I make the point that, you know, Nazi Germany also had hordes of black-clad police with military equipment attacking its own citizens. The US empire is not the first to institute that. Nazi Germany had the SS. They, too, operated in tandem with military objectives and made a hunting ground out of their own cities. Then I talk about how every empire overextends itself. Um, I say empirical governors always seek to expand, 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 or in terms of the acquisition and exploitation of resources to usurp and consume. Each military misadventure overplays itself into the next endeavor. So basically, things start out nice and easy when empires are waging these um, invasions. Like we discussed before, there's not really any resistance or it's just some local resistance in the first invasions, but as the string of invasions continues, the resistant builds, uh, resistance builds until eventually the resisting force is actually a nation state or multiple nation states acting in a coalition. And eventually they push it too far and get to the point where the opposing force is equal or greater. 
And that's exactly what happened to Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany bit off more than it could chew. And it's inevitable at this point that the US empire is going to do exactly the same thing. They're going to push it too far. And their little empire of whatever thousand military bases around the world is going to collapse. It's going to implode, whether it's economically collapse or whether, in my opinion, it's more likely that the direct um, coalition of forces that confront them will, will be too great. Um, it's coming. I have no doubt about that. And then I go right through um, the progression for Nazi Germany as to um, their overextension and the ways in which they suffered and paid for that. And then I talk about the attrition of the US allies of the so-called coalition of the willing, which has actually been getting smaller and smaller and smaller in recent years. There is in fact less and less countries who are willing to be involved in these invasions um, being waged by US empire. The allies list is getting shorter and shorter. Then I have a little, a bit more stuff about Russia and Germany, which may interest you and talking about the role of women in war and the battle of Stalingrad. There's some pretty awesome facts in there. The escalation of war seems inevitable, inevitable because it is so closely follow, following the blueprint of the past. The biggest uh, indicator of impending conflict is the imposition of economic sanctions. And this is another really pertinent uh, section of this article. And that's where I have a look at the historical role of sanctions. So sanctions were literally used 2400 years ago that's how old the practice of economic sanctions are um, and sanctions throughout history have always led to war um, sanctions and war are linked to each other there's this quote if you go against sanctions you should know nothing against sanctions but if you do that you should know that there is only war left you can sanction and sanction and sanction but eventually it leaves you with no other option than invasion. Of course, some may argue that sanctions are active warfare and certainly the method of murder, economic or military, made no difference to the half a million Iraqi children who died as a direct result of sanctions in the 1990s. Sanctions imposed by vampires held in place even after the premises under which they were imposed had been proven to be false. And this is the thing, imposing sanctions is always done more prevalently than lifting sanctions. And lifting sanctions is usually for cosmetic effect. Um, they will lift one or two sanctions, but it's almost like it's um, irreversible. They can reverse sanctions, but they almost never do. And that's because the goal isn't actually what's stated. The goal is about control. Once again, it's about control. Now, if you've watched these shows for the last few weeks, you will know a lot about the global network. The global network being what the NSA calls its established partner relationships with 100 plus countries around the globe. Their goal is to have every single country become a member of the global network. They want to monopolize the entire planet and the, and the intelligence sphere and the data and networks of every country on the globe. Sanctions are more about bringing a country into the part and into the arms of the military and industrial complex than they actually are about achieving any tactical economic aim. They, it's about supremacy. It's about control. All of this comes down to being about supremacy and about control. Okay, so there's a lot more content in this article, but I'm not actually going to go through much of it because I've made the really key points that I wanted to make. So if you want to come and have a look through the rest of it, you can. There's some stuff about Hillary there and secretaries of states. Um, and then I talk about uh, people who have provided bridges between countries at contentious times. Oh, there we are. We've made it to the end anyway. So that may be of some interest to you as well. But really, the key points I want to make here are that I believe World War III has already been happening. I believe it was happening as far back as Bush saying the whole world is a battlefield 
um, and the string of invasions that we've seen is part of World War III. Just because World War III hasn't been declared doesn't mean that it isn't already happening. Um, and that was really the thought that I wanted to leave you with. And also I would just circle back to the point that I made earlier on, which is that not one bomb could have been dropped in any of these countries without intelligence agencies. And that's the same intelligence agencies who have expanded their target pool to millions of citizens in countries that aren't supposed to be war zones and countries where they're not supposed to be at war. And they're targeting people like me who have no military background, no military training, who possess no weapons, who have no history of violence, and I end up on a terrorist watch list. There's a problem with these agencies when they have to deem people terrorists who are not terrorists and where they bring to bear military resources, targeting systems, personnel against civilians, unarmed civilians. It makes them no different than the military who are currently killing people in Ecuador. It's just these intelligence agencies kill us a lot more slowly. They kill us more slowly and they kill us more quietly. But it is the same core issue. Military, the abuse of military resources and personnel and networks in targeting and devastating the lives of citizens of their own country. Okay, I'm gonna have another quick drink now. And if you guys would like to ask me any questions, please tag me in the chats and I will ask our cool social media volunteers to um, relay your questions to me or I'll try and have a look out for a few myself. I'll answer questions for about 20 minutes and then I'm going to try and get some sleep because it's already after five o'clock in the morning here. Um, some, I hope that you enjoyed the presentation tonight. I hope that was an intriguing uh, talk for you about understanding World War III. Um, let me know what you th think about it, please. I really want the feedback and I want to know if that had any impact for you. Um, and next Sunday we will be doing the surveillance teaching and we'll be heading back to constructing our slides, which might be a bit, bit more visually impressive for you guys. Okay, I'll be back in three minutes. So.
Hey everyone, hopefully you can see and hear me again. Um, we have got a ton of questions and a couple of discussion topics. I'm going to try and knock them off really quickly. I saw someone talking about Amy Goodman. Um, I was disappointed that Amy Goodman kind of towed the line and was making Julian Assange a little bit persona non grata post-2016 election. Other than that, um, Democracy Now! is actually one of the best news sources in terms of protest movements, activism events around the world. They generally have pretty fair coverage about them, and I appreciate them as a news source for that reason, and I do watch Democracy Now! for that reason. Um, however, I do wish that they had had a bit more courage in standing by Julian and WikiLeaks. Unfortunately, they were obviously feeling the pressure from their support base and they did lapse somewhat in their support of Julian and WikiLeaks in that post-2016 election period. Um, I see somebody else asking about TPP. Um, I was a co-founder of TPPA No Way, which was a hashtag founded in New Zealand in support of the movement against the TPP. I worked on that issue for about seven years, actually. Um, worked very closely on that issue and in support of serious major mass protests against TPP. I've often said that the one thing that Trump has done that I really was very happy about and applauding was when he ditched the TPP. And I'm ashamed and disappointed that my country, New Zealand, particularly Jacinda Ardern and the Labour government that came in in 2017, one of the first things they did was to fast track and push through with the TPP ahead of any uh, participation by the United States. I think that was shameful. I think it was a betrayal of their base. Um, I think it was a betrayal of the will of the people of New Zealand and of much of the world. And it was a total corporate sellout. I would point out that WikiLeaks was the most significant publisher in terms of information about the TPP. They uh, got their hands on leaked chapters of the TPP and published them at a time when nobody else had. Their reporting was incredibly significant. They also engaged experts around the world, including Jane, Dr. Jane Kelsey, who was the founder of the New Zealand movement against the TPP, um, and had those uh, experts and specialists uh, d dissect and analyse and report on the significance of the uh, provisions of the various chapters of the TPP. Yet again, WikiLeaks provided an invaluable public service on that. Now, some, the question was specifically whether I discussed TPP in terms of understanding World War III. The answer to that is no, I didn't. However, TPP is like the big daddy version of the 90s uh, so-called free trade agreements. Um, and I did discuss TPP last week when I was talking about economic supremacy um, and how the TPP was actively supported and promoted um, and actually called an imperative to national security by the intelligence agencies. The TPP was absolutely a priority. The passage of it was the, a priority of Western intelligence agencies, and that in and of itself says a lot. Um, someone else, on the topic of pretext of war, have I read any analysis of the establishment of naval bases in the Pacific? Um, if you're talking about the pivot to Asia, then the pivot to Asia is actually covered in my article, Understanding World War III. I skipped past that part, but if you go to that article and you control F pivot to Asia, I do actually talk about that aspect of it. So you can have a read of that there. Um, and I have talked a lot in um, other articles I've done as well about that. So I assume that would cover it off. Thank you to all the people who say that this talk was valuable and thought provoking for them. I really, 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 really appreciate that. Someone else, do I have any opinion on Israel and in particular Netanyahu driving the wars in the Middle East, i.e. he was pushing to invade Iraq pre-2001 genie oil, etc. Um, absolutely, Israel is a major wager, wager or Israel constantly wages proxy wars. Um, they prefer to fight on other people's soil uh, rather than their own. They are quite happy with their apartheid regime. On, uh, I can't, it feels wrong to even say their own soil, but effectively their own soil, soil. But they prefer to take their fights to other people's countries and to fight 
in those countries. Now, I did cover off some stuff about Israel when I talked about the two eyes. In the very first episode of the series, I did an overview of all of the different collections of eyes of the intelligence agencies and talked about how US Israel have a so-called special relationship that is actually above the level even of the five eyes, the five eyes being US, UK, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. Um, so, uh, and I also talked too about how uh, Israel's penchant for these private um, uh, di digital security slash hacking companies who, um, I mean, Snowden has done great work around that. I would absolute, God, he did the greatest talk. Um, I want to say, was it late last year? I think it was late last year. He actually spoke in Israel. I mean, people, this is another thing you hear all the time. Julian doesn't publish about Israel and Snowden doesn't talk about Israel. Go to wikileaks.org, type in Israel, press enter, and then tell me that Julian doesn't publish about Israel. There is mountains of stuff about Israel in there. And Snowden uh, took a speaking engagement in Tel Aviv and then used that speaking engagement to absolutely lambast um, Israel for its uh, private hacking companies, which are supplying engineering and supplying spyware and hacking tools um, to governments uh, around the world to target, persecute, and in some cases murder activists, journalists, and dissidents. So I would definitely go and search Snowden Israel um, because that was one of the most epic and, in my opinion, consequential talks that Ed Snowden has ever done. Yes, it's 5.30 a.m. now where I am to the person who's asking. Okay, what else? I know I just missed a bunch of questions. What do I think will be the final nail in US empire? I think the weight of its own structure is what will be the final. I mean, I'd like to say that the final nail in US empire would be the um, people fight back against it and they don't stand for this anymore. Um, because people still do have the power, and that's also part of what we're seeing in Ecuador right now. Um, the Ecuadorian government is absolutely shitting themselves about the display of people power that's on the street in Ecuador. That's why they're rolling out the tanks. That's why they're acting like it's Egypt. Um, I would like to think it was, it's the people, a mass of people taking back the power, people becoming aware, people becoming learned and knowledgeable about the global network and acting to shut it down. That's what I hope. But I think that ultimately it will collapse under its own weight. Um, it relies on a perpetual growth model. And eventually it won't be able to grow anymore. There's only so many countries on this planet and only so many people to oppress and so many people to target. I think that as they continually expand the groups of society that they target, which is something we've talked a lot about in previous shows, examples of the ways that they're doing that, I think it's simply unsustainable. They won't, they, eventually they start eating their own. Eventually they'll start having to target their own support base. And once they do that, then they're in really big trouble. Okay, I feel like I just missed a bunch of questions actually. Um, One of my favorite stress reduction techniques, <laughs> uh, righteous indignation. <laughs> What's kept me going all these years hasn't been like, cause I'm really strong or because I'm really brave. It's been righteous indignation. It's been because I am so pissed off that the spy agencies of my country are in violation of their founding charter targeting their own citizens. I'm so pissed off that they are sucking up all the data of, every peop of all the people in my country and then shipping it off to a foreign government, which in my opinion is an act of treason. I am so upset that military legislation, resources, personnel, networks, are being used to target non-violent, unarmed, peaceful dissidents. 
um, in total violation of every democratic principle and all of our protected democratic and human rights. I'm so pissed off about that, that I don't care that I'm just one woman and I don't care that they have billions of dollars and I have nothing. I will ideologically oppose them because they are wrong. They are absolutely fundamentally wrong. And what they do is so immoral and so egregious and so unethical that on principle with nothing but my voice, I will oppose them until kingdom come. And hopefully enough other people will feel the same that they will lend their voices and their support and whatever little resources they have in this disgusting global economic climate to push back as well because I don't want to live in this dystopia and we who are the victims of it are ultimately going to be the ones that are going to have to and I mean victims like everybody is a victim of mass surveillance it's not just the victims of targeted surveillance like myself everybody is being traded and their private lives are being commercialized without their consent and that data is being shared around the world with foreign countries in t total violation of our civil rights. We together have a chance at shutting these guys down. When it becomes socially unacceptable to work for a spy agency, that's when we'll make some progress. When it becomes socially unacceptable to be associated with the targeting of civilians, um, then we'll make some progress. And that's the point that we've got to get to. We've got to get to the point where it's like, oh, you're applying to work at the NSA? Oh my God, how shameful. How can you be a part of that? Then, then we'll make some progress. And you know, I talk about like wanting to abolish these agencies and it's the type of conduct that I've seen and witnessed and been subjected to that makes me think they're beyond help and need to be abolished. However, if they were to stick to their actual founding charters, like if they were to spy on other spies or diplomats or foreign diplomats or whatever it is that they actually supposed to be doing, I'm okay with that. I am not okay with endless war, perpetual war, um, killing civilians, extrajudicial assassinations, uh, spying on dissidents, destroying the lives of dissidents. I'm not okay with the privatization of military functions. I'm not okay with all of these private intelligence companies and spying companies and mercenaries and everything running around targeting people for profit. I'm not okay with any of that. But if they could take it back to day one and do what they're actually freaking supposed to be doing, on public dollars, that in that situation, I would never have come to oppose them. I would never be taking a moral stand against them. I wouldn't know any different because I wouldn't have been dragged into their insane games and subjected to their shit. So it's not that I just think all intelligence agencies should be shut down, but I think they should be doing their actual job, which they're actually founded to do, which was not to target their own citizens and not to target civilians who are unarmed and who have never hurt anyone and never going to hurt anyone. So that's my little lecture on that. Okay, guys, I'm going to wrap it there. I'm sorry. I know there's a lot of other questions. But I'm pretty pooped now. I've been talking for two and a half hours and I need to take a break. Um, I deeply appreciate you being here. Um, I would absolutely ask, it's really, I'd like to say it's really cool that people super chat on Graham's channel, but do know that that money goes to Graham and I'm happy for it to go to Graham because it is, it is actually phenomenally awesome of him. It's a great act of solidarity for him. Uh, to lend me his audience. Like, what a cool guy to do that. What a cool guy to stand up and support someone like me um, whose work is so contentious. Um, and he lends me 50,000 subscribers every week because he wants these messages and this information to get out. And that says a lot about who Graham is as a person. Um, the fact that he's willing to publicly stand by me and stand by my work and my situation 
says a huge amount about him and that he lends me the platform that he's built from his own work to do it, I greatly respect and greatly appreciate. Um, likewise, I want to take action against these agencies. I want to fight back and set some meaningful precedents. I want to get um, some restitution for what they've cost me and my children and my family. Um, and to do that, I do need you guys to donate. And to donate, you go to oneversus5i.com slash donate and please give generously or if you can't, which I completely understand, there are so many people that are in a position that they simply don't have 50 cents, you know, to their names, that um, instead you just pick up these messages, these links, promote the short videos, any of the content on the YouTube channel, the website, any of it, spread it as far and wide as you can because as you can see, no media is admitting that there is a woman and two kids living in exile in Russia from New Zealand for the last three and a half years because of persecution by state agencies. They will not admit that. They will not promote this campaign. So word of mouth is the only way that we can build something important here and that we can break through. So thank you so, so much. I'm going to blow you a kiss. And I'm going to see you next week. I saw one person ask, will I be back again next Sunday? I will be back again next Sunday. I'll see you next week for the surveillance teaching, for opening the five eyes, exposing the methods of the spies. Ka kite anoa, as we see in New Zealand. And good night, everybody. Hi, my name is Susie. I'm an activist and a journalist from Auckland, New Zealand. For years, I've worked on controversial issues like the corruption of our intelligence agencies. I was severely targeted as a result of my work. This led to my articles being amplified by the world's most accomplished publisher. In 2016, I made a documentary about how and why I was forced to leave my country. I have now sought refuge in Russia and my situation has become public. On 882 6PR, the voice of Perth. It's 12.30 right now and Tony with you and I'm really happy we finally got through to uh, Moscow to my friend over there, Susie Dawson. You're listening to a 95 BFM podcast. Susie Dawson is a Kiwi activist and journalist who worked as a member of Occupy Auckland's media team at that time. Now, Five years later and following involvement in GCSB and TPPA opposition, she's seeking asylum in Russia, alleging she has been spied on, harassed and threatened by the police. Welcome back to The Wire. Now, finally on the show today, last week it was announced that Susie Dawson will be the new leader of the Internet Party. Welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. We have a special guest with us. It's Susie Dawson. She's an activist, journalist, former party leader and current president of the Internet Party. Susie Dawson, an activist and citizen journalist currently seeking asylum in Moscow. Susie has written extensively on surveillance and the deep state and claims it's not safe for her in New Zealand. My name is Craig Tuck. I'm a lawyer from New Zealand. I act in the area of international human rights. I act for Susie Dawson, along with a group of other lawyers throughout the world who act for journalists and dissenters in high-profile cases, including the case of Julian Assange. As far back as 2012, Susie has been trying to warn New Zealanders and other citizens around the world about state targeting and surveillance of citizens and the methods being used to do it. Surveillance in New Zealand is now so widespread, it's not an issue of police going and getting a warrant and doing an investigation and then it all coming out in court. The vast majority of the surveillance that's undertaken is never going to be aired in a courtroom. And by that I'm talking about cell phone technologies, I'm talking about lawful interception is the term that the companies that do this like to use. There is a corporation in Wellington, New Zealand called SSI Corp. And you can Google them and you can look at their website. And on their website, they're so good as to explain at length exactly what they do and, and how legal it is for them to do it. And essentially, they can intercept virtually any communication. If they have someone at range, they can 
hear your actual conversations, but also through cell phones they can essentially turn them into microphones and hear any conversation that's had within the vicinity. They can see your text messages, they can see what photos are on your phone, they can see what files are on your phone, they can read your emails, they can just intercept all kinds of information. Any intelligence service in the world that has significant funding and a real technological research team can own that phone the minute it connects to their network. As soon as you turn it on, it can be theirs. They can turn it into a microphone. They can take pictures from it. They can take the data off of it. But it's important to understand that these things are typically done on a targeted basis. Not only was Susie essentially blowing a whistle on state level spying, she was naming the precise entities that years later it would be proven had in fact been doing it. And the fact that these are private corporations that are doing it should be really concerning to us. The crowd that they got, that they outsourced it to, was TCIL, which was, I believe, Thompson & Clark Investigations Limited. The state is contracting a private company to surveil you. And to me, that's really immoral, absolutely immoral. Some six years later, in December 2018, an official State Services Commission report confirmed that New Zealand government agencies had been employing Thompson and Clark Investigations Limited to target New Zealand citizens. This is a private company that had essentially been instructed by state agencies and departments to spy on citizens. More than a dozen police staff are under investigation for passing sensitive information to the private investigators Thompson and Clark. Thompson and Clark. Security firm Thompson and Clark. Thompson and Clark. Uh, Thompson and Clark. So Thompson and Clark, aren't, aren't they? Aren't some of them old police officers? Ah, uh, yes, they are. Okay, so does that explain the relationship and the free flow of information? Doesn't it actually seem a bit crass? Um, well. At the end of the day, I guess um, what I trust is people's intent. This report identifies perhaps inappropriately close relationships. Morning teas paid for by um, Thompson and Clark. Invitations to go out for drinks. Were there other companies oh. identified where you inappropriately gave them information or just Thompson and Clark? Um, there, there are a myriad of security companies who inquire of police every day. For instance, insurance mm. security. But that's not my question. People listening to this will think, hey, Thompson and Clark were getting stellar, top shelf, gold star treatment from the police. Why? Do you treat other security firms the same as you were treating this one? Yeah. How do you seriously think it looks to, to members of the public listening to this? Thompson and Clark hasn't just been paid by the government to spy on Greenpeace and earthquake claimants in Christchurch. Tonight, Checkpoint can reveal the controversial security firm has been also monitoring the activities of another three activist groups in Northland, Coromandel and Wellington, and the activities of at least one further claimant. Susie has been involved at the very highest levels with people facing charges from prosecutions coming out of the Eastern District Court of Virginia in the United States. There are more prosecutions to follow of currently unnamed persons. Importantly, information will be coming out in the months to come that will provide transparency and clarity and lead to accountability. Suppression and prosecution of dissenters can't be allowed in New Zealand or elsewhere. That's why Susie's team is launching the hashtag One Versus Five I campaign and with your help can achieve some important victories for democracy and for each and every one of us.